discussion. There's another 15 minutes on IoT discussion. It's also important to note that by 2020, which has started already, 82% of organizations will have to invest in AI. And a priority of AI is really information. And that information comes in digital format. Because if that information is not in digital format, it's in a filing cabinet or it's in a lecture, you have, will not have the ability to digest, consume, and then provide insights from that information. And as we are seeing now with COVID, the first thing that's actually happening now is that because we need, uh, we are necessitated to provide the operations in different areas, we then now start capturing those data now. In the future, the data that we're capturing the last few months of our operation will then be the basis for our insights using AI moving forward. So just plainly, digital transformation is the use of new, fast, and frequently changing digital technology. But this is the caveat. It's not the use, but rather the use to solve problems. So digital transformation at its core is not buying IT systems. It's not uh, you know, subscribing to anything. It's really the ability to utilize the ever-changing ecosystem to solve problems. Okay? Uh, and transforming processes that are non-digital from manual to digital. So sometimes, and this is important, a transition of a process from manual to digital is not sufficient or in fact strategic uh, digital transformation. There has to be a reimagining and reinventing of the processes. So ultimately, the purpose of digital transformation is to generate value, all right? So if you're spending so much money on IT equipment, on IT system, and you're not generating value, rather producing the same thing, then you're not, in effect, undergoing a digital transformation. Another study shows that 91% of business leaders see digital transformation as finding efficiencies. In a more global, competitive economy, any, any juice you can get for being more efficient will prove to be a competitive advantage. 68% uh, says it will increase profits. Why? Primarily because either it opens up new markets, new services, or in many cases, it just reduces your cost of operation. Uh, and then I think to me, this is the most important one. 85% offer digital services or become irrelevant, especially now. Proof point is that if you cannot buy your grocery online, for most of us, particularly me in Quezon City, then all those nice, very beautiful, well-stocked uh, grocery for me now is irrelevant to my needs now. And then 64% said that in four years, uh, they need to complete the digital transformation or go out of business. This is very insightful. For example, if your business requires you to do massive infrastructure to host your business, and the ROI of that infrastructure is typically, what, four or five years to depreciate all those investments in the building, and you don't know what the market will be two months from now or next year, then perhaps all those investments from a risk planning point of view uh, might, might seem uh, a bit risky. All right. So we use this as a uh, uh, model for digital transformation. Generally, there are four pillars of which we operate our business. That first is to engage our customers. One is in operation. One is in product development or service development. And one is in uh, the people, the hiring, the, the training, and so on and so forth. All of those activities generally work in silos. And all of them generate digital signals. Customers will have your CRM, they will have your contact information, they will have your propensity, and so on and so forth. Operations will have uh, 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 data signals that will show you output, that will show you uh, movement, that will show you velocity of activity, and that will show you at any point in time the state of your operation. R&D will then have to generate uh, signals as to what's the state of your current product. Is it competitive from a price point of view, from a performance point of view? Uh, what are the materials available? And they all generate host, host of data. And of course, employees generate data, payroll data, uh, training data, hiring data, where do they hire, what's the propensity, what's the educational attainment, what are the skills currently available? They all generate data. The idea of a digital transformation is to actually synthesize all of those to generate data. Most of the time, many industries generate all of this data in silos, which then necessitates a need to put all of this data together, which then necessitates not just visibility of all of, all of those data across many domains, but more importantly, to architect that data so that they're able to relate to each other. 
And more importantly, those data, and many companies can do this, they can actually put those data together, must generate improved business outcomes. Otherwise, as we have uh, seen in the Bible, uh, faith without works is dead. So data without corresponding business actions is rather useless. So the point is uh, that customer signals, a uh, deeper relationship with your customers must go back to R&D, must go back to operation. Uh, uh, more efficient operation, operational data must result in more efficient, uh, efficient operation. Product telemetry must result in better products and more effective employees, uh, signals from employees must generate uh, more productive employees. And at the same time, how they interact with all the other domains. We call this the digital feedback loop. And if you do not have this model, the first thing you need to do is first uh, gather your data, make it visible, curate that data, make it uh, interact with each other, and then provide, generate insight and intelligence on that data. From a Philippine context, there really have, we have had enough sufficient uh, legal frameworks for that. We already have a Data Privacy Act, 2012. Clearly, it's not perfect, but clearly better than everyone else. You know, this is really important, and I will highlight this later in the next slide, the E-Commerce Act. This was uh, created and enacted into law 20 years ago, two, two decades ago. And still we ask the same questions on whether a digital signature is legally acceptable or whether a digital contract is legally acceptable. It has been resolved two decades ago in the e-commerce act. We now have the telecommute act. The problem with telecommute is that it's voluntary now. It seems like COVID did not make it voluntary anymore. I think they're amending it to include uh, to make it, uh, to, I guess, strengthen the prerequisites of that. The DICT Act, which is supposed to provide the legal framework and the advice, and then the cloud-first policy. But this one applies mostly to government entities, GOCCs, and instrumentalities of government. Let me just highlight this in the E-Commerce Act, uh, Section 7. It says, electronic documents shall have the legal effect, validity, enforceability as any other document or legal writing. If your organization is still asking these questions, you are two decades away from uh, the realities. Uh, of course, when we do this, we have to do we, we have to unlock value, and there are generally four focus areas to do that. Not just the IT. In fact, when you look at this, it's really not IT centric. First, you have to define your vision and strategy. It is key to developing a strong roadmap to help move organizations forward. Okay, so that's one. Vision and strategy needs to translate into day-to-day -day action, day-to-day -day values, which is then called our culture. And we need a creating, uh, we need to unify a, an elastic culture that invites diversity. Why do you need diversity in the organization? Because for innovation, diversity of ideas is required. If your organization agrees in everything, in everything that you do, you're probably uh, in trouble because you probably will have just one approach to the varied multidimensional problems we're actually encountering now. So actually, this uh, promoting, not dissent, but promoting a challenging mind, challenger mindset is actually healthy moving forward in the digital economy. And then also, you must amplify. The point is, not every organization is the same, nor do they attempt to, to attack the, the problem all at the same time. There are strong suits and weak suits. So you must identify and amplify your, your organization's potential. And then clearly, you cannot expect to wake up one morning and expect all your organization to be able to do digital transformation if you have not spent one cent on their training. And training now ceases to be a one-time activity. There has to be a constant learning mindset. We call it in the organization, in our organization, the learn-it-all mindset rather than an know-it-all mindset. Okay? So our Satya, some time back, says that before there was a new uh, tech company and a traditional company. What uh, the CEO is saying is that every company now is a software company and you have to start thinking like a digital company uh, and that uh, embedded in your operation must be a digital thinking. In fact, Daniel Newman said, in a world where data rules, all companies are tech companies. So if you're not a tech company now, you're in trouble. So whether you're in medicine, you're in retail, you're in manufacturing, you're in, the, you're in real estate. If that real estate is not a tech company, if that um, uh, health uh, uh, organization is not a tech company, you'll probably be hard put to compete in the coming days. And I think now we come to the more important part. In the new digital economy, trust is the new currency. And therefore, digital investment should not be viewed as an operational expense, but as an asset that generates the trust currency. And this has been before COVID, you know, when you take the grab, when you go to Airbnb, 
a large degree of trust is embedded in that transaction. You do not know the operator. You do not know the driver. Conversely, the driver does not know you. And yet, you go and operate uh, with a certain degree that the contract that you have done online will be executed. So trust is a critical element so that the online consumers will engage you. Okay? So what's your engaging uh, environment? These are the four pillars. We will not go through it. But it's really important. There is no trust if there is no security. You cannot just pray to God and hope that your system will not let down. Embedded in your culture, in each and every one of it, just like risk compliance, security must be part of that. There has to be privacy and control. Uh, remember the time when people trust those who trust their money. So OPM, other people's money. Now, it's really important that your organization will also project that you are an organization that they can trust to put their personal information on other people's data. You have to take that seriously and you have to uh, provide mechanisms to make sure that uh, privacy and control is part of your organization. There has to be a culture of compliance, uh, deeply compliance, because now you cannot control everyone in a, in a assembly line environment. You're not all in the same place. And therefore, compliance must be put in place so that everyone will make sure that the policies they put in will be followed and ultimately transparency. Why? Because the digital economy is inherently transparent, both in terms of pricing, service delivery, uh, in, in terms of commitment. Uh, so now that everything is transparent in real time, you will have to also imbibe that. Meron na ba kayong inventory nito? I don't know. When will it happen? I don't know. Uh, maybe in about two, three weeks. It depends on these factors. Cannot be that way in terms of operating. As we use technology, it's double-edged. More and more uh, technologies uh, will be used for good, societal good, and will be used for societal ruin. The same technology that we use to protect our homes can be used to spy on our homes. So therefore, ultimately, as a, as a society and as an organization, we must deeply embed digital ethics in the way we use technology to make sure that that technology is used only for good. Lastly, it's a, uh, well, not lastly, the next one, it's digital transformation. Many times, there's a critical action and digital transformation that will involve the whole organization, the money that they bring into their family, and the future of their investment. And they put that in an IT director and then expect everything to happen. If your CIO, if your head or your board is not in charge of your digital transformation, your digital transformation will fail. It will be a one-dimensional, IT-centric, rather than systems improvement centric activity. So the highest person should always be in charge of digital transformation. And it's imperative that we must change our paradigm. Before, when we have a factory, the idea is to control each and every factor of the environment so that we can produce the intended result. Now that we cannot control, and we realize now with COVID that control is an illusion, we must change that paradigm and shift it from control to empowerment. We must empower our people to be able to do good, to be able to do well on their own, both by training, by the culture, by the values, and later on at, the, at that series, by the technology that they use. So we must enable them. And these are some things that we need to check. Do you pay and collect? If you are not collecting digitally now, you probably are not collecting anything. If you're not paying digitally now, you probably are not paying anything with all the lockdown that we have. So if you're not doing that, do it quickly because that's the lifeblood of the organization. If you cannot do it digitally, uh, you will be hard pressed. Do you recognize digital documents? Do you recognize digital signatures? Sir, wala pang approval, especially in government, approval of leave, approval of per, uh, pay, uh, procurement, approval of anything. And then say, wala pa ho kasi yung papel na may pirma. Why do we need that? Because it's a control mechanism. We now need to reimagine and reinvent all this control mechanism. Because as per e-commerce law, two decades ago, digital signatures are legally binding. So the ways in which we approach people sometimes are often outdated. We still do time in, time out. We do remote learning, but we want people to time in, time out. Hindi siya aligned. There's really still that, that back of your mind, there's still that paradigm that, that hours equals productivity. And that con uh, compensation equals number of hours work. Factory, right? That's not the way it is now. It's probably not going to be the way we do now. So we need to reimagine, revisit our labor laws, uh, our compensation laws, because now more and more it will now be on an output basis. And clearly, at the end of the day, in the digital transformation, we go back to the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are never digital. We must strengthen our ability to assess ethical questions, 
We must make technology make us more human, not less human. We must go back to social sciences to, uh, to understand why people do what they do and then reflect that in our technologies. And ultimately, we cannot ignore that arts plays a critical part in how we live and how we cope. And therefore, technology should serve that rather than supplant it. So you can choose not to join. It's really your prerogative. You can stay analog, right? Uh, that's an option. But let me tell you a story of the panda bear. You know, everyone from a marketing point of view, excuse me for that, from a marketing point of view, the pandas have international recognition and international likability. Everyone loves a panda bear. They're so cute and everyone knows them, uh, universal, okay? In a traditional business, those two are really great assets already. Uh, international recognition, international likability. But do you know that panda bears uh, only eat one type of food? That's a particular type of bamboo. And that bamboo only thrives in a particular uh, place on the geography, one, uh, one, one, one band, okay? Because out above and beyond that band, they don't grow, right? And that, that band only grows in one particular aspect. And more importantly, they're only fertile every three months. And all those three items combined makes them an extremely unadaptable uh, creature. So it's the same for our businesses. You must not aim for international recognition and international likability. What really truly matters for you, not just to survive, but to thrive, is to be able to be resilient, to be adaptable, and more importantly, to be relevant. Otherwise, you'll be obsolete. Now, I added this slide because we're talking to investors. The X in DX, uh, the X factors in digital trans, things to look out for, whether something is worth uh, investing on. First, you have to check, do they have omni-channel? What is that omni-channel? They recognize their customer, whether their customer walks in the store, goes online, use their phone, or use another channel. As far as their systems are concerned, they recognize that this is one and the same person. And therefore, we have their history of transaction preferences, et cetera. If uh, uh, an organization is able to do that with their customer, that's a good sign for their digital transformation. Number two, is their security adequate? Have they been, eventually everyone will be hacked. The ability is to check whether it's difficult to hack or hard to hack. And if it gets hacked, what are their uh, um, rollback mechanisms to ensure that they go back to a safe state? Next one is privacy. Is this organization protecting the privacy? Are they making money of that information, the privacy? More and more as we get digital customers, the privacy will become more and more rele relevant. Organizations in logistics, uh, and I'm fairly sure that remote everything is like Pandora's box. Once it's out, people will realize we have done it before. I was able to be productive, at least for some parts of the organization. Why do we need to go back and spend another two hours driving to and fro when I can do the same to be as productive? And therefore, the necessity for logistics organization becomes higher. The next one is that if you are unable to inspect something or to find visual, uh, 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 visual uh, periphery of what needs to be done, those with virtual reality or the capability to see what they cannot be present at that point as accurate as possible puts everyone at the disadvantage. And finally, in the interest of time, we can you know, take another two hours to discuss each and every one of these. Is the organization into remote sensing? All those parts that they need and all those data that they need to capture, can they capture it automatically, remotely, 24 hours, seven days? If it's present in the organization, maintenance of power plants, maintenance of equipment, maintenance of towers, you know, all of those things uh, will put them in a good uh, place. So finally, as a segue, and uh, Madam Ida will uh, mention this later, this is a slide that tells you the transition from the analog to the digital. In this slide, the part about the analog being transitioned to digital is not the important part. The important part in this one is the hand that holds them. Ultimately, it's really about empowering employees, uh, uh, allowing for a transformation, not just of the tools, but rather more importantly of the mindset is the most important. And with that, I end. Uh, if there are questions, we can answer it on the chat or we can uh, discuss it later in the discussion. So I will stop my sharing and transfer us back to our host. Thank you very much, Mr. Moya. One that's so excellent. You have an excellent presentation and 15 minutes is not enough to discuss all those things. But there are a lot of questions already on the chat box. We'll answer that later. Okay, our next speaker is another member of ICB's Tech Governance Committee, Ms. Ida Senisa Tiongson. Ida is CEO and president of multi-billion special purpose vehicle company 
Opal for Portfolio Investments, SPV AMC Inc., which is an ING formed company in charge of distressed assets and turning around businesses. She started as a traditional banker spanning 22 years of experience with National Australia Bank, a senior lending officer, and Philippine National Bank, most recently as SVP, heading remedial management. She lectures at Ateneo Graduate School of Business on topics of corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, loan structuring, problem loan management, and corporate rehabilitation. Ida also sits in various boards, including publicly listed tech company, Surpass Inc., and Singapore's FinTech Global Resources, and serves as trustee of several organizations like Institute of Corporate Directors, FinTech Alliance Philippines, FinTech Philippine Association, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, let us put our hands together, Ms. Ida Chongson. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Chair Phil. Thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you, Chair Evelyn Singson. Um, ICB Chair, Mr. Rex Trilon, um, President of Sherfield, uh, Fred, and President of ICB, um, Mr. Leonard. And um, we have several common boards, board members, I should say, Dr. Fred, Ms. Boots, Ms. Marivy, and the rest of the trustees of both organizations. Thank you for this invite. Okay, the topic that has been um, given to me is uh, on the I beg your pardon, I'll just start here. It's on the uh, digital transformation, long-term success and sustainability. Okay, just prior to this, I just saw a chat, someone asking me about my hand. It's, it's actually overuse. That's because I've been typing a lot, texting, um, doing a lot of uh, payment transactions using my hand. There's another way of improving this. I'm gonna tackle that later. Okay, um, as mentioned by Bon, we gotta separate this. Digital is more of the adoption of technology and the transformation, the X, digital transformation, the X, is how the organization is built to change, innovate, reinvent, enhance, and support the traditional methods. Bon has shown this, and it really is one of my favorite slides. I'm not gonna go through it in detail, I'm gonna go through more on that pen and that hand, because those are important when it comes to digital transformation, particularly the hand. Now, before this, may I? Um, we believe that the long-term success and sustainability involves strategy, people and culture, and of course, technology. It's a combination of the three. And, um, I want to show you first statistics, and this is a, the light blue is a pre-COVID statistics, and the white part of it is a post-COVID statistics. This is uh, five weeks away from, um, so this is around about April uh, to May statistics. So if you actually notice, in the banking sector, um, we started with 51%, so I cannot see my slide there. And then um, it, it's gone up to 73%. Um, it's up by 40%. If you look at insurance, it's only up by 8% because the transformation is basically more on the payments at this point. Um, you have the grocery, which is uh, transformed by more than 100%. But still, it's still only around about 61% and increasing. And if I may say so on that, um, there's been a reverse a bit because while people went into um, online grocery, some people pulled back and simply because they're not, um, especially for the meat and the vegetables and the fruits, they weren't um, quite happy in terms of the, the structure. And they may be a third way of doing that digitally. And it's, um, it's uh, uh, augmented reality. You know, you could use the goggles and go in the grocery and actually pick the items yourself and the robot would put it in the grocery. That's uh, a little bit down the line. Um, apparel has increased 13%. We have um, going down, we have the entertainment. Entertainment, this is, by the way, more Netflix. 
and look at this social media. I mean, th thanks to TikTok, it has increased by 90%. We have travel still here because this is only five, five to six weeks away from lockdown, and some countries have been doing travel, but the travel, we expect that negative. Um, telco carriers and utilities. I won't go through that in much detail. That would take actually an hour to discuss. But what I want to uh, tell people is, um, someone asked me, Ida, you know, I've done digital transformation. How come I'm not getting my clients? So I say, th the thing is, it's not really about the digital transformation per se. In fact, according to statistics, digital transformation uh, coming from the 2015, 16, 17, 18, up to the 19, only 16% success of those ones converting. So what are really the key factors in the success of long-term and sustainability of digital transformation? So rather than answering what is, I'm going to answer the myth. Okay. First myth, improving IT systems leads to digital transformation. According to David Rogers in his book, The Digital Playbook, um, it's really not about tech, but about strategy, leadership, and new ways of thinking. We're talking about the hand and the brain. D quote, unquote, digital transformation is fundamentally not about technology, but about strategy. Although it may require upgrading your IT systems, architecture, the more important upgrade is strategic thinking. Upgrade your strategic thinking, yes, but of course technology should be in the same power. Now I'm gonna, pre-COVID, a restaurant owner has the option of going into a cluster or going alone. If you go by yourself and just be situated there, you have a captured market, yes, because there's hardly any competition, but when you go to a cluster, there's a foot tra traffic, and maybe there's really, more, um, there's really more market there for you. In the digital world, it's an app. Do you do it solely, or do you go to a cluster like Zalora, Lazada, Shopee, where there's foot traffic? The change in mindset in which way to go about it is that strategic thinking. Um, just going through this, um, I, I have like, I think, 15 minutes to complete, so I'm going to go this fairly quickly. Another myth improving operations is strategic digital transformation. Now, this time, according to Michael Porter, use tech to be better at what we do. But you need to also add one important factor, which is critical thinking. Need to distinguish between operational effectiveness and strategic positioning. For example, when we just had a lockdown, um, I myself, you know, I, I Gone through a little, but not all our documents. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, that should have been in a blockchain, digital ledger, so all my staff could, could have actually gone into it. Or you have a choice. Um, we have a drop, Dropbox, which is more of the cloud, or you can have your own server, except it's limited to a particular area. Um, basically, what I'm saying is, it's really not the tool, but it is the strategy is about making a decision about the operational change. Another example, Jollibee. Jollibee just announced 200 plus restaurants to be closed. Yet in the same week, that was August 8th, and August 11th, they announced we are launching, or they have launched cloud, uh, I beg your pardon, um, ghost uh, kitchen or cloud kitchen. What is that? You basically can be in one place and basically just a kitchen because everything else could be um, by delivery. So improving more deliveries rather than the brick and mortar. That is an operational change. Um, next myth. Digital, improving digital marketing is digital transformation. There is, uh, again, important, which is the mind shift. What is your goal? Is it, if your goal is business as usual, you know, Jack Ma said, I, I need only two servers and I could get millions. He said that in 2009 and in 2000, as early as 2007, he already reached that. He said, I'm going to be bigger than Walmart. And, and he is because that goal and this gap that we're referring to 
that is your transformation. How can you get from one to the other without completing all of these transformational um, strategies? Okay. What is important though, when you're talking about the digital transformation and the digital marketing, yes, you have communication and yes, you have technology. More often than not, for, for um, heads, you leave it to them, yet the missing factor and the most important is really that leadership. Um, communication technology provide the rapid solution. More often than not, again, as I mentioned, most important is the leadership we could oftentimes absent. So how can you really do a total transformation? Leaders need to re-envision and drive the change. All digital, another myth, all digital strategies are good strategies. Uh, all right, I want to sample here uh, the grocery online where I started doing the, the, the groceries online, but I shifted back to the usual groceries simply because I got disappointed with the quality of the vegetable. Um, according to Richard Rumiot, um, it's really divided into three. First, you gotta find out what is your problem, diagnose it. Then you go into what action must be done. Okay, they cannot reach us, we gotta go digital. Um, we need our processes in place with automatic um, purchase and automatic in, uh, inventory. You gotta have that coherent action. And when we're talking about the coherent, act, uh, coherent action that's really part of the solving of the problem, you've got to have that guiding principle. Otherwise, if it's incomplete, you're going to have an incoherent action. Okay. Principles um, of uh, having a really good strategy, really good framework. There are seven principles. You've got to know yourself. You've got to know your capability. Of course, you gotta know your customers, find out the taste of your customers, find out why are they complaining, that's actually positive for you because that's also statistics. Marketplace, do you rather have a restaurant solely or you're, you're part of a bigger picture? Resources, affordability, so you need to bucket first what you can afford, first digital payment, second, I would go into an app, next, I would go into an AI, you know, it, it depends on what resources you have. Um, looking at market position, what share are you really targeting? It's really about visioning as well. This is uh, engines of growth. Do you really have scalability or that's really only your capacity? And whatever tactics, which is again in line with the strategy. Now I wanna pause for a second and I'm gonna talk about my hand. Um, you know, I, um, because I've been working on my hand, it's starting to have a pain and I'm really, hoping that the banks would already do an Alexa or similar to a, um, an AI where you can, it's voice activate, activated. It's similar to Siri. Um, and, and by the way, Zoom has Fred, which is your AI secretary. You can actually use that, that's AI, where straight after the meeting, it will record without you typing, in case you don't know that. Um, so, there is actually a technology that is always evolving and we got to know where our positioning would be. So if I may just, excuse me. I would like to transfer funds. Good morning, Claire. There are delays on your journey. Your schedule has been brought forward. Today's goals include a morning run. Your aim is five kilometers. How may I help you? Congratulations. You have hit your fitness goal. Your driverless car will arrive in five minutes.
Um, you need to see where you're heading at because the future is interconnected. What is your strategic shift? While thinking, please do not forget your heart, which is what we're being referred to by Bon and myself, which is the good governance part of it. And please also do not forget, not just the head, to take the hand with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ida Tiongson, for that uh, very excellent presentation also. And I love the, the, the setup. <laughs> okay. Uh, now for our final speaker and later the discussion moderator during Q&A, my esteemed colleague at PNA Grand Thornton, Mr. Emiliano Libria III. Third is the head of the Advisory Services Division at PNA Grand Thornton. He is a well-rounded information technology and finance professional with extensive experience in information technology, information technology unit, financial audits, and business consulting. At PNA Grand Thornton, where he started his career, he worked with the Assurance Division, Business Risk Services Group, and the Corporate Finance Division. Third was the second recipient of the PNA Grant Thornton's prestigious Primus Award for Individual Excellence. Before returning to PNA Grant Thornton in 2009, he held the managerial position with the Information Technology Group of one of the world's largest investment banks. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Third Librea. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for ICB and Chair Phil for for inviting me to this event. No. Um, I'd like to, so I'm at the tail end of this, uh, of this panel, and I'd like to synthesize um, a lot of what uh, Ambon and Ida talked about and really try to help uh, answer the question on, um, for investors, what is the value of digital transformation? So my presentation is very brief. So it's just maybe four or five slides, and I'd like to go to fundamentals, apply it to the, current uh, pandemic uh, situation that we have, and then, and then attempt to uh, show how DX or digital transformation can generate value um, for businesses and for investors. Um, and then I'll end it off with some key questions that um, you as an investor can ask okay, with regard to digital transformation initiatives of those companies that you invest. In. So allow me to share my slides. All right. Okay, I'll go straight to it. Okay, so at, uh, from a value perspective, okay, so most stockholders, uh, well, as a basic requirement of any investment is that you would want a return on your investment. And as an investor, this would be either dividends or payments of, um, of loan amortizations if you're investing on the debt side. And it could also be, of course, growth in value of stock or underlying collateral or underlying assets. So that's where your value is coming from. So those are the investor desires. 
okay, and a fundamental. Of course, that's not the only one. Some investors will have other, um, other, uh, our, uh, what do you call this, objectives with regard to their investment, but these would be the core, right? And companies would have corporate goals that are aligned to that, okay? And of course, it will be different per company, but in general, companies would have goals around revenue growth, or cost reduction, or better liquidity, or better quality, or more market share, right? So, so those are the variations. You know, all companies that are for profit will have these corporate goals with the intention of providing value to stockholders and to all the other stakeholders you know, in their um, uh, uh, that uh, rely on the corporation. Okay, with DX, with digital transformation. And my experiences with um, digital transformations in a variety of companies, sometimes there is a disconnect okay, between these corporate goals and the goals of digital transformation projects. So just as an example, so you would have digital transformation projects where their goals are around things like greater user adoption or better user experience, right? Things like this, no? reduction of handoffs between divisions or disaster recovery. I think the challenge around that is that it is not in the language directly of the corporate goals. No? So when you're talking about greater user adaption or better user um, experience, what does that translate to? Does that translate to revenue growth? Does that translate to better market share? Right? So, so Sometimes there is that disconnect, and it can be for a variety of reasons. You know? It could be a messaging issue. It could be that the proponents of the digital transformation project are not very um, comfortable committing to these kinds of uh, goals and metrics, you know? um, which is unusual. You know? When we talk about uh, CapEx, let's say common CapEx. So let's say when a, when a manufacturing company decides to Let's expand plant uh, facilities, okay? So the alignment is usually very clear, right? I want to invest in um, a new plant in, in Visayas, for instance, because um, I want, there is unmet demand in the Visayas region and putting it there would be, so it's, it's very directly related and easily translatable to the corporate goals, right? Sometimes with DX, it's not, it's not that clear, okay? So it should be, so for value to be generate, to be um, identified in relation to the digital transformation project, I think that disconnect, that messaging needs to be made much, much clearer, right? So by, by improving um, greater user adoption, improve, improving the user experience, we will actually achieve revenue growth of X or, retain um, lost uh, revenue because of this or whatever it is, right? So th this just goes back to what Bon and Ida was saying, that um, you have to be solving a problem, right? So Bon was saying it has to solve a problem or a potential problem, and the digital transformation needs to address those problems. So what Ida was saying around um, strategy, overall strategy, that has to tie in as well for it to have value for the organization. And on top of that, there should be, of course, a worthwhile business case, just like any um, capital investment, capital expenditure of a company. Okay, now I'll try to apply that to the current situation. So the, so, so the pandemic problem areas that we are facing right now, um, not necessarily for all companies, but for most, would fall under these four general areas. No? And these, um, these four areas have affected our performance, of the performance of the corporations that we are investing in, and they have also shaped um, how the corporations respond to this pandemic. No? So we have fallen demand, we have a sudden drop in consumption. So obviously B2C companies felt it first, and there was, of course, a chain effect on industry down the line. No? In the value chain, no? so 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 that's why we have this recession right now. I think the bigger question with the fall in demand um, problem is that whether there is an emerging customer behavior change. Okay, so so is this 
permanent. And, and that's really uh, a problem that, you know, I don't think there is a definitive answer to that at this point. No? So a lot of the corporate strategies and your response to this will really depend on your views around this particular um, area. No? So what is going to happen to my customer? How will they behave? Is this a permanent behavioral change? Okay. And then another problem area, of course, is workforce availability, obviously. You know, so employees cannot get to their places of work. Um, uh, things that you have to do at your workplace impact utilization of the workplaces. You know, you're required to, to enforce physical distancing. You have to um, put in all these barriers and um, other uh, health protection uh, mechanisms you know, in your workplace. And that, of course, lowers productivity. Okay, supply chain issues. So the flow of goods have been impeded at ports and at roads. No? And again, what that means is lower conversion of your, uh, in your value chain to revenue and eventually to cash, no? which results in, of course, what we are all facing, what a lot of companies are facing, cash shortages. No? So not only because of the additional costs of how you respond to the pandemic in the short term, but the, the chain effects that this is causing Okay, throughout the economy is resulting in collection issues. And then some banks, for some banks, it's not helping. They're becoming very tight you know, on, on, on helping companies handle uh, the financing, you know, which is overall resulting in, in cash shortages. Okay, so if this is the problem at this point in time, okay, how can DX add value? How can digital transformation add value? So I have a sample, um, I have a sample, um, response, okay? So, so for instance, with a fall in demand, with a fall in demand um, challenge, okay, and under the assumption that this sample um, company okay, is a B2C company, right? Um, and the company has already made a decision that no, the, the customers still want to buy our products. They just cannot get to our brick and mortar stores, okay? So let's say that is the hypothesis of, um, of, the, of the board and of, of, of management. No. So what, have, what they've decided to do is to implement uh, e-commerce, okay, which they never had. And the objectives of that is to offset revenue losses or also potentially to penetrate new markets that they never reached before. Okay, so, so, so that, as, as you can see, that, that um, project, that IT project, the intention is directly linked to the goal of either maintaining revenue or uh, increasing revenue or reducing further uh, uh, revenue erosion. Okay, so things like that. Now. So, but it has to be tied in to a corporate, um, the corporate uh, goal. Okay, and then with the workforce availability issue for the same company, Okay, so um, let's just say that the, if in the old, old state, if in the old state you have the sales force or promodizers or um, people in store actively um, discussing with uh, customers and, and in effect pushing product to customers, no? can you create a digital channel okay, so that your sales force and your marketing can connect better to those same customers, or maybe even other customers, right? Um, I think the big issue now with the with uh, with the current situation is that brand becomes more and more and more important because there is no because the physical experience of interacting with products um, and services has been reduced significantly with the current situation. How do you? Well, the tendency of a consumer is to go with with um, products that they know that are known. Okay, so 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 brand becomes so important, and the question is how do you tackle brand in the um, in a digital way? No? So digital marketing. No? So that goes has to go hand in hand. No? Okay, so you can put your workforce, your sales and marketing workforce, okay, to that challenge of digital marketing. Okay, and then. If you extend the roadmap, so integrate sales and fulfillment so that you minimize user experience issues. You can also apply some digital transformation here. Okay? And then lastly, when you go to the tail end of the value chain, which is on your cash, 
No? So you can integrate cash cycle through digital billing or digital payments, which Bon already talked about at the start. No? And eventually, you reap the benefits. So this is a roadmap for how digital transfer, a sample roadmap. I'm not saying that this is going to work for each and every company. Of course, each and every company has their own um, assessment of their market and you know whether this is going to work for their um, for their particular situation. Also, of course, whether they have sufficient cash no, to spend to make something like this work. Um, but this is an example of uh, how digital transformation can increase value, okay? which is essentially by connecting each um, part of the roadmap, your digital transformation roadmap, to the problems that they intend to solve and to the corporate KRAs that, for which you have set goals. So it's the key questions for digital transformation as an investor and what you need to ask are, what goals in KRAs does this project support? Okay. So that you have to ask that from the company. Okay. Are project objectives aligned to what the corporation wants? No? As what Ida said around corporate strategy, is it aligned? Okay. And then finally, is there a business case? Right? How long before I can recover my investment? Um, the usual questions around on, on CapEx. So, so these are the same questions that you need to be asking. Um, what's interesting and a di differentiator, I think, between physical CapEx projects and digital transformation projects, are there is a lot of potential for quick wins. So what is the roadmap for this project? Because it's an intangible good. Okay, so it's an intangible good, and there is what's called a minimum viable product or a minimum viable solution that you know, digital transformation proponents can implement to get some quick wins and quick value out of any project. So that is enshrined in a roadmap. So for instance, that roadmap that I showed a while ago. So all those particular um, projects don't need to go live all at once, right? But they are, there is a sequence right, that you can follow all right, so, so that in the end, you are re reap the benefits of the entire digital transformation journey. Um, also, uh, you need to ask what are the go, no go decision points. Okay, so, so in the roadmap, as you implement the project, are there go, no go decision points? Um, and that ties into my third, the third question that should be asked, and sometimes it's forgotten. So if this, if this project is directly linked to a corporate objective, a corporate goal. And because they're directly linked, so for instance, if this project is intended to recover lost revenue from a, from a foot traffic channel, let's say. Okay, so if that is the intention of this digital transformation project, then there should be KPIs directly integrated into the project that allows you to measure whether you are meeting that. After all, this is a digital project, right? So it should not be troublesome to have to generate the metrics to know if you are achieving right, your goals, right? So, so that should be baked into the project and should be part of the project initiation document okay? or the business requirements document, something that you know, the IT guys can go and build into the platform or the solution and then to make sure that when you need the data, you can look at it, you can find out where the project is going, and then make quick decisions on whether you need to move a bit, shift a bit your strategy or what. No. Okay, so um, that concludes my presentation, Mai. Um, back to you. So I hope I haven't uh, extended. Too no, much. that's okay. Th thank you very much, Third. Thank you very much. So maybe you can now, there are a lot of questions on, um, that were logged in. So maybe you can, third, you have, you can see them. Wait a minute, let's, um, where is it? It's not in Q&A. Yeah, it's, it's in, the in the chat. Somewhere in the chat, somewhere yeah. in the Q&A. Well, some of the Q&A have already been answered, Bin Naman. Yeah. There are some in the okay, has this been answered? Okay, let me just go through. Um, um, for Bon, for Bon, uh, how should a company approach its digital transformation journey? In your opinion, well, it's it's part and parcel of an overall uh, re envisioning and reimagining of the business. In fact, the fact that it's uh, precisely nuanced into just digital transformation 
says a lot that it, they see it as a siloed approach to. So all businesses, whether it's digital, non-digital, undergo a regular re rethinking, repositioning, re-strategizing. That's so, so that's how they should done it. What is the new company that we want to bring about in the next coming years, days, and how do we go about it? I am fairly certain it's a necessary component of that new company to always have a digital component. I think that's that. Okay, thank think you, that's I have my... I also have an answer to that. No, no, I have also have an answer to that question. And in my opinion, I always look at the value chain, no? the value chain. And so I typically start when I help companies in this area. I start front to back. Okay, and, and some, some, no, no, some, some, com, some, of course, some organizations prefer it the other way around or do it all at the same time. But I always start with the front, meaning meaning the sales marketing side, and then you go back. Okay, uh, in terms of if, if you want to, if there's a question on approach to a digital transformation journey. So what strategy should you implement at the front? And what does that mean for the back of the office? Ida, maybe you'd like to add to that. Yeah, yeah, I actually do. Um, okay, I, I do want to start an example, which is the retail, which is the most popular now because a lot of them are really not making money. Um, so for a retailer, you have the option, you have several options. What strategy should you go to? Which option should you go to? Do you remain and do a wait and see for you to, uh, for the market to reopen? Let's remember that fear at the moment is driving the economy, fear. I, I think even when there's a vaccine, people will still be fearful. So assuming that you have a timeline on this and the difficulty about this pandemic is, it's hard to know the timeline. So should you retain on a brick and mortar and just have a transformation on um, payments and deliveries? Or should you do a similar to the cloud kitchen concept where you have 20 branches down to very few in areas which are quite cheap and basically small, small warehouses where you can deliver fairly quickly to your um, if your statistics would say, oh, I have a lot of clients in Pasay. So maybe you should be located in Pasay. So first is diagnose, then get the information in. And of course, there's always that costing to this. Um, but if you look at the brick and mortar having the 20 branches down to maybe only eight in key areas, it's really cheaper to go via the cloud kitchen concept, which is just having that um, small warehouses. You know, we can cite, this is an exciting um, topic. Actually, I could go on and on for half a day on different industries about this. Um, the, the examples that I've encountered, apart from the retail, restaurant, um, bank, banks, are a little bit most, uh, the most difficult one, but it's the most exciting. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I guess corollary to that, no? So uh, a question for all of us is, how should companies evaluate the costs and benefits of a digital transformation program versus its impact on shareholder return? Okay, so um, I, I, again, uh, my, 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 my position in this is no different from any, you know, underta any capital expenditure undertaking. Okay, when a company goes through something like that, okay, the, the, the business case is part of it, right? So when you're create, when you're establishing a new plant or establishing a new um, marketing channel, right? Um, it's the same. No, you have a you have to measure. You have to come up with a with projections on on how much this is going to cost and how much is it supposed to return to, to you. And of of course, no, that that all is d directed towards eventually, you know, the achievement of target profits and you know, eventual return to, um, to investors. Um, bon or Ida? Ida first, maybe? Okay. Um, cost. Uh, so we're talking about ROI, uh, cost analysis. Well, first is it's not an expense. It's an investment. And the lifetime of the investment and the shift. Well, first is, as Bon mentioned, you needed to survive at this point. When I talk about need to survive at the very minimum, the low-hanging fruit is the digital payment. So you've got to have that. So it's not even a question of should I have it or should I not? Is it going to cost me? You will die if you don't have it, so to speak. But the other transformation, should you go AI? Should you go this? And, and so on. Again, that would re uh, depend on a strategic shift. Now that you've, now that you've um, calculated, um, for example, uh, an app 
um, I'm going to put monetary numbers into this, a, a, an app where everything's in it um, from end to end um, may cost you on a middle to large around about half a million. But if it's only a simple app, it's probably only 5,000. So it actually depends on where. Um, and remember, if you're converting, especially brick and mortar to something a little bit simpler, you can reallocate the cost where you can technically sell some of the assets and really invest more on the transformation. For the banks, I'd say, guys, you, you've got to have AI. I mean, I cannot uh, reiterate, um, you know, as a board member of a, a, a bank, you would want information straight away. And delay of information can cost you business. A lot of the rural banks were closed during the pandemic. Who are open? Who can open an account? You have Union Bank. Gcash, Paymaya, well, they're not banks, but you can open an account. And guess what? What happened to their sales? It's zoomed up. Um, bon, you'd like to add to that? Yes, uh, two answers. The first one, in truth, in dollars and cents, because of the hyper-efficiency of uh, what they call hyper-cloud providers, costs have, have actually gone down. So immediately, mm. taking out your data centers, okay. putting everything on the cloud, will have immediate yeah. impact on your bottom line. Uh, and more importantly, the subsequent operational expense of having to reinvent, secure, redundancy and all of that will go away because that's now part of a service offering of any secure, hyperscaled cloud provider without even mentioning anyone. So immediately there is. Uh, so, but ultimately, the, the next question is what are the costs the true cost is that if you don't do it, you will not have any business. And it's as simple as what Mam Ida said. It's really as simple as if you cannot get their money digitally, you will not have cash flow. And the question then becomes, how much more month can our cash flow sustain ourselves without being replenished? That's your reaction time, I think, on IPO or you go bankrupt. Uh, if I cannot see my customers or I cannot talk to my customers now, digitally or in whatever form, if I don't do it quick, the cost of my business is the total business value, I think. Third, there's a, there's a question on top. So can, may I read it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, okay. I am having a hard time. Sabi dito, so we understand now really how important this is digital transformation. Why isn't the government walking the talk? What needs to be done? <laughs> I'd, I'd love to answer that. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> the, the government is actually doing a lot of things. Under the original PESA, a Philippine Economic Stimulus Act, digital has been mentioned, uh, digital transformation and digital, uh, and FinTech for, for that matter, mentioned 17 times. And at this very moment, there are actually two major bills. Um, it's sitting at the Senate, and it's actually looking at um, how the, all the government offices can be transformed digitally um, under the ARTA. So there's actually several regulations pushing that. You have the Banco Central, um, pushing that as well. I have not seen um, uh, any government agencies not really leading towards that. Even the BIR and Bonn is one of the panel uh, in the hack attacks where they're trying to convert that digitally as well. So the answer is yes, the government is doing a lot of things now, um, better late than never, and um, really aggressively pushing for it. I have an answer. There's a related question to Bonn on the on electronic signatures, no, which which affects quite a lot of uh, of, uh, of us, no, uh, particularly in relation to uh, transactions with government. Uh, bon, uh, can you clarify that? Uh, there was a question here where can you clarify that around e signatures in transactions and why many government institutions still do not accept e signatures for official documents. I'll leave the answer to those two questions. So four dimension. The first dimension is that your digital transformation is not dependent on government action. If you think it is, you're in trouble. So that, that's the first one. Second, to be fair, and Adida already mentioned it, the, all the policy regulatory has all, is already present. There's the e-commerce app. There's the, the, the Banco Central has been very uh, forward-looking in all of, the, all of these things. Uh, so really none. The third answer is that innovation seldom comes from an institution like the government because they're really designed to control, not to innovate. And that's really the private sector's part 
So in many instances, they really just catch up. Their job is to ensure that whatever happens is good for society in general, right? And therefore, once in a while, it steps in to stop certain technologies that it feels from a societal mm -hmm. point of view. So that's their job. It's not their job to lead in digital transformation. The answer to the other one is uh, uh, the signature. I think there are two answers to that. The truth is, if for that transaction to be valid, both parties just need to recognize it. Even without the government saying it, if both parties recognize that the digital signature is valid, then that transaction is done. So stop being overly dependent on the, mm -hmm. your survival to other groups. The second one, I think, is because the, the courts have yet to issue a ruling because it has yet to be answered. And therefore, government being cautious will remain in its normal rhythm, right? until the court explicitly states otherwise, uh, I think that's the reason. But again, having said that, all it takes for this to be valid is for two parties to recognize both of it as binding. And, and if I may, um, just to add on to this, uh, uh, one of the board members, uh, the president of uh, MAP, and one of, I think your board members, Francis Lim, um, has already been lobbying way back, I think it was 2017, and uh, the good news is it's being looked at. What am I saying, lobbying? We're talking about example, bit of absolute sale. You're gonna have it notarized. So it becomes a paper transaction. Can you have a digital notary? The digital no notary is still in question. Digital signature is a yes. And um, for government offices, they're really worried that did you really sign this? What's the proof? You know, so they do halfway digital, but once um, things are actually ironed out, and I agree with Bon, um, the, the other documents minus those ones that you need to be notarized at this point are actually in the e-commerce law already. That's right. Okay. Um. Sorry, third, may I, um, there's a, a early na natabuna na ata by Mr. Mon and Mr. Dan. Okay, Mr. Mon, um, I agree with you about the, the grocery. In fact, um, what Mary Mart um, has done quite, uh, you know, very good in terms of the public offering simply because there's a, um, positive um, uh, projections when it comes to online groceries, apart from a little bit of brick and mortar, but online groceries. Certainly, um, my experience on the quality of the vegetables is, in fact, uh, just a point that not everything's digital. There's actually something that you've got to look at your products and services as well. You, you've got to look at the whole thing. So I want to answer that. Um, and Dan asked, uh, do we have examples of those ones that have actually shifted and um, have done well? Of course, uh, internationally, Zoom is equivalent to seven airlines now, or we're using it. TikTok, um, in the local setting, we have the aid app by the Ayala. Um, that has gone, um, the, the, the aid, uh, it's a home visit doctor that will give you injections and whatever you need rather than going to the hospital. So that has increased. Um, there's the multi group. They have done a lot of projects. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, the Paymaya and, and the Grab and, and uh, um, Lala Move, they're all on the rise because they're meeting the market demand. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ida. Uh, Sir, there's another one from Mr. Dan Agustin. Do you see it? It's in the chat. Ah, okay, so here. <laughs> So I'm looking at multiple screens to look for the questions. Okay, um, okay, here's a question. What digital controls must be installed by the board to prevent fraud financial risks like what happened to Wirecard? Hmm. That's uh, I was hoping Mom Ida will answer this. I know I, 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 I can't <laughs> answer, but I just answered because I just um, I'm actually following Wirecard. But if you want to answer, Bon, go ahead. Uh, no, it's just really structural. Uh, the board being responsible for all of this uh, must have an oversight group. So clearly an IT risk group uh, is a necessary now component that should meet regularly and that should report uh, regularly. That's, that's one. Uh, the board needs to be informed, needs to know the issues and the relevant issues. And then make accountable people in the organization, senior accountable for the security, not just to lay it, but to operationalize and regularly check that. I think that's my sense. Yeah, um, the question was around digital controls. I, I think that was the question. What digital controls must be installed by the board? 
Um, Which begs the question, what digital control I, do you need? So, yeah. again, it, there's a series of actions. Sorry, Ma'am Ida, please go ahead. Sir, okay. Um, uh, in the case of Wirecard, of course, we know about the couple of billion dollars uh, missing, um, and then it has the Philippine operation. But if you actually backtrack um, in terms of the history of Wirecard, it started as um, gaming, porn, and eventually it had a series of questionable transactions, but it shifted more into the payments. Um, and when it shifted more into the payments, uh, my question in terms of the um, control, were the accountants aware how the, uh, this thing's working? Why did they sign off the 2017 financial statements when they weren't able to open the the Singapore um, uh, information. There's also this uh, circuitous way of doing the transfers. Um, so there's a lot of why questions. And in fact, if I may say so, the uh, two independent directors uh, in the audit committee did question. Um, and Baffin uh, supported even question um, and saying that, you know, you, 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 you're just, having interest of pulling down the market and then picking it up. So, uh, so eventually they said, okay, we'll hire another external auditor to check it out. And there you go, they, the, the other external auditor, uh, KPMG, wasn't able to confirm the missing um, funds or, or was it there in the first place. So there were series of, it's not an overnight thing. There's a series of why. And I think at the board level, sometimes it could be, the dependency of success and you, know, you have the regulators backing you up when our duty when it comes to the risk and the audit committee is to ask a lot of questions and go deeper into it. Um, because I, I, I myself, you know, I, we don't know the, the whole story behind the investigation, but there's a lot of why um, in that case. Yeah, management fraud is, um, it seems to be the case with this, uh, no, no, with this uh, situation. And we don't really know even at this point if, you know, some board members were actually involved in the deception. No, we do not know. Okay, but it seems to be the case. And it's something that's really very hard to control. You know, um, and, and really, you just have the three lines of defense. No? So, so the first line of defense is your management, of course, implementing its controls. Then you have the board. Then you have the, the, audit and the, sorry, the internal audit. And then you have the risk and management committee of the board. So those are your only lines of defense, really, against all this. So if, if it's particularly management and potentially board fraud, um, then you already have those two lines of defense, or maybe all of them down, right? And it's very hard to really control um, against that. No? And, it's, and it's government that will have to, to, to step in. No? In this particular case, even the, even the government, um, Baffin, no? was a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe... Um, they were protecting or coddling too much wire card potentially. We don't know, but it seems to be the case. So, so yeah. yeah. And if I may add, um, in terms of your organization, the values formation must be strengthened because the key component of the fraud, you could have all the three components for fraud to, to affect uh, rationalization, opportunity, and of course, on the process. Um, and if we take out the rationalization, rationalization part, which is basically embed good values um, that could um, not eradicate, but uh, control it in a way. And of course, the whistleblower policy uh, should be strengthened as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to just pivot back to digital transformation. Um, this is a question for, for Bon. I for Bon. Uh, DX is a long-term process to be realized by an entity. Kindly, please expound further on the importance of continuity of leadership um, on the, and the continuity of the program so that digital transformation would be successful and it would really create value for the company. Well, let me state first that uh, continuity of leadership helps in finishing the task. Okay. However, uh, you don't need continuity of leadership to ensure you finish the task. It's really part, continuity of governance is not necessarily the same as continuity of leadership. I think, and if, if, if your organization in, is based on certain personalities to conclude its programs for its shareholders, then it's, it's a bit shaky. So I think governance is important, continuity of governance and consistency of governance 
is important. In addition to that, consistency of retraining and reskilling of the employee is, is also important. I think that's what he means by being a long term. And part of that consistency of retraining is not to build something that has an end goal, to train our uh, employees in the use of our enterprise agreement is not sufficient. It has to be to enable our organizations to equip themselves with our current enterprise and to be comfortable with all other new things that may come to happen. That component is equally important in the digital transformation. I hope that answered. If not, feel free to ask more specific items. Uh, it's my son's graduation online today. It's a, it's a bit, I'm a bit distracted. The resistance to change is a, it's a very big barrier for, uh, yeah. for a lot of so, Correct. In the digital transformation, the digital resistance is not as difficult as the transformation resistance. Actually, this, this ties in, I think, to linking it to corporate objectives. Eh? For instance, if, you, if your, your corporate goal is to reduce cost, let's say that's your primary um, objective, and then your response is a digital transformation initiative to reduce the number of people in your organization, then you will automatically get resistance to the project, right? So the messaging and the communication and the buy-in around, you know, how to package this entire, this entire um, uh, transformation journey is very critical you know, to, to how you can ensure commitment to the project. Um, Ida, would you like to add to that? Uh, no, it's okay. I think that's very well answered, and I think there's a lot of questions that we need to tackle. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's look at more questions. But let me add that it shouldn't be a goal to reduce the number of employees. I think that's I think that's the wrong digital transformation goal. Okay. The, the digital transformation goal should be to find new value generated by the digital transformation. Um, okay, this one is on privacy and artificial intelligence. Okay, the advantage of having personal AI is awesome, but what about personal privacy? Some YouTube videos showed examples of AI collecting one's visual and audio information without clear permission. How do you shorten the data privacy permission format for easier clarity and understanding by individual customer? Okay, so this so this is a uh, uh, one if I can one you if I can answer that. Then. So um, I, I think some some of the some of the internet startups have started doing this and have made their legalese sound so much easier, read so much easier and clearer. No, um. I, I, I've read a few, no, some terms of service and some privacy statements from from various uh, organizations, and some of them have stopped being, you know, reading like a super long legal contract, no. And I guess that's very important in engendering trust with your users. Um, bon, Ida, would you like to add? So, but it's really making it, you know, making your your lang your legal language and converting that into something that's really more palatable for for general public consumption. I think the easiest one, and and I don't mean this to be in in any way. I know the easiest one is to simply visit the privacy.ph website. Everything you need to know, everything is all there. I think. You mean the uh, National Privacy Commission website, right? Yes, I think it's a uh, privacy uh, I think yes. that's the URL. Okay. Um, Very straightforward. Third, uh, one or two questions, so you can summarize after. Um, have we missed any question? I think we've answered all the questions, right? Um, wait, I'm just double checking if I missed anything. Um, there is one. one LGU yata. Ah, sorry. If I may introduce one of the questions, yes. uh, will all this digital transformation result in net gain in jobs or not? I think that's a critical because at the bottom of that question is a fear that all this transformation will impact me negatively because I will lose my job. Yes. So, so what's your answer to that question? Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, the answer, of course, is that all uh, uh, disruption globally for historically have always generated net new jobs. 
from 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 manufacturing of clothes to manufacturing of cars to manufacturing of airplanes to restaurants to all of those generated eventually more jobs than it actually did. So the additional value actually creates more opportunities. Okay. Yep. I think the challenge is more around reskilling. You know? So and which I think goes to back to your point of um, uh, continuous learning for people because yeah. Um, yeah. It is, yes, it is possible that you know jobs that there, is, there are new there will be new jobs created out of all this uh, additional value and then you know some people if they don't adapt and reskill themselves might not be able to do those jobs so I think that's where the the, the issue is so and of course that's a bigger challenge than just a digital transformation. Uh, challenge. Um, okay, um, Mai, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, maybe we Third can... Parang I saw one from Chris Cabalatungan. Yes. Sales, marketing, operating efficiencies, among others, are the top of mind concerns of businesses that were disrupted by the pandemic, while digital transformation strategic isn't the strategy, the plan, or the, to the, or the tool to achieve. Um, so uh, yes, uh, a lot of the areas, those areas have been disrupted. Sales, marketing, operating efficiencies, and there, therefore there's a need to um, tweak. Uh, I'm not sure uh, specifically, is it okay to open the mic for Chris to expound on the question? Um, Chris, can you uh, open your mic? Please go ahead and unmute, Sir Chris. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Chris, you may be on mute. Um, well, if not, may I answer this in general format and maybe Bon can answer this as well. Certainly, um, you know, a lot of, especially the marketing people, they're, they're feeling, uh, okay, am I even needed? Um, can the organization go directly? I mean, let's call state the state. Organiza organizations now are not just tech companies. You've got to be marketing companies as well because you need to understand how to do this digitally in terms of the marketing. So, oh, I think Chris is there. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Go ahead, oh, Chris. Okay, in the, well, I would just take an, I sort of reacting to that uh, presentation about, uh, you know, uh, operating efficiencies, etc. Mm. As, uh, as a myth. And it's really digital transformation is really a strategy. But then, you know, strategies really should only be a plan, but the driving force for that, I believe, should be the concerns of the businesses about okay. operating efficiencies efficiencies, sales and marketing efficiencies with the disruption, which were disrupted because of the pandemic. So I think that uh, those concerns, the operating sales and marketing efficiencies among, among others should be the driving force, should be among the driving force for developing the strategy and not really be dismissed as just myth. No. Okay. Um, yes, Chris is uh, absolutely correct. Those three areas, you got to diagnose and then complete and find out what the proper tool is and what their leadership is actually thinking in terms of what move you want to make. So I, I confirm that, Chris. Thank you, Ida. Thank you. And I also want to, can I raise a question to Bong? Sure, sir. Yeah, Bong, uh, just a follow-up to the, my pre uh, question earlier about uh, its impact on employment or unemployment opportunities, the digital transformation. Because every time we introduce something to make an efficient, uh, efficient, uh, efficient, a cheap efficiency in the operation, it always normally it will result to some uh, some uh, jobs being redundant and uh, I know and uh, causing unemployment. And I was thinking that you know on the way to that digital transformation, businesses should also prioritize the sociological impact 
of this transformation, especially to the to the uh, labor force. We all just try agree, but uh, let me cite an example. In the U.S., outsourcing their customer service clearly removed some job in the U.S. but generated more jobs in the Philippines. So the jobs shifted. I think to some degree, many of the digital transformation is like that. It shifts from one group of workers to the others. I agree with you the, the, as, as uh, they're not just merely inputs to productivity, but rather part of a uh, bigger societal uh, group. And therefore, we should come intervene. I think to me, the best intervention would be a reskilling program. This is to ensure not to keep those jobs, but to ensure that even if the jobs shift, and they will, your employees will have the ability to be nimble, retrain, etc., etc. I think the problem is really more difficult for that sector in the job where it becomes really difficult to reskill because they have invested much time in the knowledges that are already being challenged. I think that's the critical thing. But we cannot subsidize work on the basis of a changing environment because that's not sustainable. Right? Yeah, because right now some of those businesses which are shifting to digital uh, 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 ways of delivering their services and their goods, and in effect that would replace those people who used to deliver, deliver these goods and services manually, and those jobs will disappear permanently. Yes, sir. However, let me say, for example, Grab. Uh, uh, many taxi drivers lost the standard franchising model of taxi. And then they shifted to doing Grab, buying their own uh, uh, car on a loan basis, making sense of the cash flow. It then generated that new set of drivers as well. So this, I think that's a good example of, of uh, shifting some. Okay, thanks, Mon. So third? Yes, okay, so I think we're out of time, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe some closing remarks uh, from each of the panelists, strangely, including myself, Mike. <laughs> so yeah, so we have uh, Bon first, and then Ida, and then I'll, I'll end. I think at the core is not digital transformation. At the core is really transformation. And at the end of it, it's really ultimately not that they exist, but more and more, they're doing two things. They're becoming faster, and they're highlighting our inability and our uncomfortability in all these changes. So ultimately, the change is really a mindset change, uh, also a societal change. If, for example, the, the, the pace is too, break, you know, uh, too fast, then collectively we should come in and tell everyone that just because it's there doesn't mean we should all do it and collectively come up with that uh, as, as a general. And now it's easier because that, that flow of information is, is so much faster. Uh, but in the end, this is really brought about fear uh, and really, ultimately, about uh, personal financial security, uh, societal security, and all the items. So, uh, and, and, and the answer is the way we have coped with all other changes only more quickly to remain resilient, to remain informed, to remain compassionate with other people, and try to use, utilize whatever tools to create a better, uh, more human society than it was before, not just merely more efficient. I think in the end, that's, that's what I wanted to end with. Thank you, Bon. Ida? Okay. My take is, this is actually Bon's slide, my most favorite slide when it comes to digital transformation. Um, we believe uh, in strategy. Uh, I will reiterate this because it helps create a competitive advantage. Uh, people and culture of innovation does sustain it and technology is the means by which it's delivered. It's neither the pen nor the drawing, it's the hand, which is the most important factor, which is really more of the people. And if I may say so, I'm with Bon uh, when he says, you know, you've got to be kinder, you're going to be more compassionate. Please let's look at our people. Our people may be encountering some problems. And by the way, the recent Dole Department of Labor with DPI that came out only August 15 included one of the protocols you gotta have mental awareness and, and, and the way that we should handle our people because our people is really um, most important to deliver uh, and help us, not just in the business, but the continuity and success of the business. Um, with that, you know, strengthening this, uh, I, I wanna, um, I cannot reiterate more. Um, when it comes to technology, please do remember that good governance 
does play a major part. Trust is a, is a major part of this because you could have everything, but if the people do not trust you, they will still shift. Thank you, third. Thank you, Ida. Okay, from my, from, from my side, no? so the um, so digital transformation and investment metric in the new normal. So as I mentioned, the um, digital transformation initiatives need to be tied in to corporate goals, no? to corporate strategy for it to have value to the organization and to investors. So it has to flow. So it has to flow. Okay, if it doesn't flow, if there's a disconnect, then there's definitely a problem with that, uh, no, no, with that uh, digital transformation initiative. And because it's digital, there is a way for, 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 for the boards and for um, management to exert um, govern, more better governance around these initiatives because they should measure themselves, no? because it is a digital uh, initiative. So all the KPIs, all the results should be easily generated by the system so that you would have an idea whether it is indeed meeting the goals of the organization to generate value for everyone who are uh, involved. So thank you very much. And my on to you. Yeah, thank you very much for our three great speakers for the wonderful exchange of ideas. Mr. Bon started it with why digital transformation. Then um, Ida discussed about DX, digital transformation and long-term success or DX as a strategy. And then third, um, discuss about digital transformation as investment metrics. Again, uh, another warm round of virtual applause for our three wonderful speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.